Coming up this week, how many soccer fields does the Metro need? Lee Summit promising one of the best soccer complexes in the nation. We have a development round robbing for you from Cerna, officially launching its new $4 billion campus on the site of the former Bannister Mall, to the future of Metcalf South, to whatever happened to the Mission Gateway project. Also this week, Nixon's State of the State. Plus, after the better part of a year of debate, why Kansas City rejects giving more power to the mayor and other big changes to the way city government operates and reflecting on Martin Luther King Day in the Metro. Welcome everyone, I'm Nick Haynes and thanks for joining us again on the program that goes beyond the soundbite and takes you behind the headlines making news in Kansas City. Reviewing those news headlines this week from the Call newspaper senior writer Eric Wesson, Kansas City Star development reporter Kevin Collison, star political reporter blogger and columnist Dave Helling, and from the editorial pages of the Kansas City Star, Barbara Shelley. Jay Nixon in the limelight this week as the Missouri governor delivers his State of the State address where he announces he wants hundreds of millions of dollars more for schools and also is committed to expanding Medicaid in Missouri this legislative session. And each day we don't act. Nearly 300,000 working Missourians go another day without the treatment they desperately need for no other reason than they live in Branson instead of Bentonville, in Cape Girardeau instead of Cairo, in Maryville instead of Muscatine. And if you don't see these folks knocking on your doors or lighting up your phone lines, it's because they don't have time. They're working. Now, we all know there are problems with Obamacare, and Washington's implementation of it has been abysmal. Yeah, but rejecting Medicaid won't fix any of those things. OK, Governor Nixon there. You know, he's getting applause from Democrats, but is this an issue out of his control? Because this is a legislature overwhelmingly controlled by Republicans, Eric Wesson, who have said categorically they have absolutely no interest in expanding Medicaid this session. Right. And I don't think that they have a plan in which to go across party lines to get any of them to listen. But one of the things that I found interesting and when I was researching this is a lot of people with the Medicaid are rural people. And so it's, it's really hurting their constituents. And I don't understand why Republicans still are so uh, steadfast in not wanting to do anything to expand the Medicaid. Well, one reason is they would argue that in 2020, but really just over five years from now, it would cost $200 million a year, even though the federal government is picking up all of the charges now, if the state of Missouri were to expand Medi Medicaid, it would cost $200 million in the 10 percent share that the state of Missouri would have to pay. And where is that money going to come from, Barbara? Well, I focus on that, but, um, you know, there's been several good studies done on this, and there are offsets. You know, um, the state spends money now on mental health care for treatment for indigents. Most of those people would be covered under a Medicaid expansion. Um, you know, there's also uh, projected to be a pretty big economic lift from, um, you know, expanding the state's medical treatment network uh, the way it would. One other interesting nugget from this week, though, was the fact that we had Senator, former Senator Kit Bond now coming on board to be lobbying the legislature in favor of expanding Medicaid. Right. Uh, that's an interesting twist to all of this. Well, but we, how much influence will he have, Dave? Well, it, interesting indeed, Nick, but um, yeah, unlikely. Uh, unlikely that he can change Republican minds, uh, at least this session, as we've talked about so many times on this program, the, the opposition to expanding Medicaid among Republicans in Missouri is visceral, it's political, it's much more based on philosophy than it is on the facts. As Eric and uh, Barb just talked about, there are facts that make sense in terms of expanding it, but, but really if you talk to Republicans, they just don't want to do it because they don't like Obamacare and they think expanding Medicaid would endorse that. In a, in a different world, the Republicans in Jeff City really want to cut taxes this year, cut taxes across the board. In a perfect world, there's a deal to be made 
we work with you on taxes, you work with us right. on Medicaid. That's how legislation used to work. Uh, not in Missouri this year, it doesn't seem like. But the tax cuts are really important uh, because for businesses here in the Kansas City area, there is this fear that they're losing all of these jobs and all of these businesses in the state of Missouri to Kansas, uh, Kevin Collison. We've heard of this business border battle that you yourself have talked well, about, about extensively. about it quite a bit. Um, you know, and of course, we've also written the fact that uh, a lot of uh, the tax cuts in Kansas haven't really produced the kinds of uh, economic windfalls they've expected. Uh, you know, it's... Missouri's already a very low tax state. I mean, that has been, been pointed out numerous times. And when you look at regular studies, you know, this is not a Minnesota or a Massachusetts by any stretch. And so the tax argument is kind of hard to, uh, to equate with any kind of prosperity on one side of the border or another. And it's been pretty much a wash. What's also interesting about Kit Bond, and this gets back into what these guys are talking about, I was fascinated to see the people that are paying him the money to lobby is the Missouri Chamber of Commerce, which again shows this huge rupture between kind of this grassroots, knee-jerk anti-Obamacare, anti-Medicaid, and the more established Republican Party that recognized the economic benefits to the state of participating in this program, which again is just kind of a reflection of the uh, fractures within the Republican Party. Eric. One of the things I found interesting in his comments was talking about the Obamacare and the problems that they have. Well, Missouri doesn't have the exchange, they have the marketplace. And he might want to look at that as well because I've been trying to get insurance for my eight month old since January the 4th and I can't get anybody to pick up the phone, much less get that process started. So when he's throwing bricks at Obamacare, he might want to look at locally what can be done to improve the system that they have here. Well, last week, Governor Nixon was in Kansas City and tweeted over the weekend, what a week for KCMO with a new Ford F-150, 1,000th worker hired on the transit van and 15,000 Cerna jobs coming to the former Bannister Mall site. The scale of that project is only now coming into view. The $4.3 billion office project would be bigger than the Sprint campus. In fact, Kevin Collison, the biggest office development in Kansas City history you write in the Kansas City Star? Well, yes. Yeah, so if you take a look at uh, you know the standards uh, <laughs> contemporarily, there I am. Yes. <laughs> uh, which one? Uh, Are you on the left or the right? There. Oh, okay. Well, well, <laughs> now it's you know it's it's certainly a a very encouraging thing that we've got a company like Cerner that is again rolling back into the whole healthcare issue. One of the major reasons that company is prospering is because of the cost savings involved as hospitals engage in more electronic record processing, etc., which has been Cerner's bread and butter. And it's also a global company. They've had major uh, contracts in England and throughout the world. So this is the kind of wealth we love to see. And I just want to add also, one thing that also was admitted was there was another wonderful uh, uh, 600 jobs coming up to uh, Kansas City International in the aircraft maintenance, uh, an outfit uh, called Aviation Technical Services. These are real jobs. This isn't getting back to the whole border war shell game that's been going on around here. Cerner is creating new jobs for uh, high-tech people to bring into our community. Ford and, and, and uh, GM are creating good blue-collar jobs that provide the kind of wherewithal that families can support. And this new ATS, uh, Aviation Technical Services, is going to put a lot of people back to work who lost their jobs when American and TWA closed their aircraft maintenance. This is solid, positive economic news. And it's also going to create, again, a lot of work for construction folks, because if this thing comes together with Cerner as planned, that's going to be four plus billion or million feet, excuse me, of, of uh, office space being built down there. Yeah. Dave. The, uh, viewers should understand that the, the, the basic dispute this year in Jefferson City over tax policy will involve the difference between Jay Nixon's approach, which is targeted tax cuts for companies like Ford and Cerner and other companies that promise to bring jobs, build things, uh, tax credits, that type of thing, against the Republicans who prefer a more broad-based uh, you know, reduction in tax rates for individuals. Uh, the bill that passed out of the state Senate committee uh, yesterday uh, uh, cut taxes dramatically for sole proprietorships, people who own their own businesses over time, linked to the growth in income in the state. I'll get too technical. But the broad disagreement is 
Should the government pick which companies get tax advantages, or should everybody get a tax break? And, and, and they couldn't agree last year. We'll see if they can do it this year. What does this mean for that area, though, Eric Wesson, where the Bannister Mall site is? I mean, we certainly can see all those jobs there, but that's been an impoverished area now yes. for some time. Uh, since the Bannister Mall left or closed, uh, hopefully it will spur economic development and movement, people buying homes there, building homes there in that area. If he's hiring people that, you know, for technical reasons that are coming in, they want to be close to work, they've got a lot of land space out there. So it will definitely be a shot in the arm. I think within that area, it's probably been maybe one or two new businesses over the last decade almost. So it'll, yeah, that, it'll definitely help them. That area has really languished. And as the area has languished, so has the school district in that area, the Hickman Mills School District. And now mm -hmm. that Cerner's coming in there, the onus is really on Hickman Mills to pick up its game because it's in danger of losing its accreditation, too. Is and, this one of these deals, though, when, when a company comes in and gets huge, and they getting a massive amount of incentives right. to also be there. Does about. the school district lose out as a result of that? Well, in this particular case, um, as we had an editorial in our mm -hmm. paper today, the Hickman Mills School District is going to get what a, a $6 million payment as part okay. of this whole thing to help him improve. You know, again, you got a mall that hasn't been paying any taxes and has been an increasing blighting influence on the surrounding area, reducing property values. You can make the argument that Cerner going in there it may not pay the full freight of additional new tax revenues that would be generated if the whole thing was taxed at its, at its normal value, but it's also going to have a, a, a very positive effect. And also, getting back to what we were talking about, how that's going to help the area around it, I don't think anybody is under the illusion that people, a lot of the people who are going to work at that Cerner facility are going to want to buy homes next to it, but it will spur hopefully some residual business development, some commercial activity around there, and raise some of that uh, prosperity and provide jobs for people in the neighborhood. And if the city gets it together and maybe builds on this investment by Cerner, there may be some other types of opportunities there. Uh, but right now, as I talk to uh, Mr., uh, a couple of the people at Cerner, one of the reasons they love that Bannister site is the fact it's right off Interstate 435. And you can live in southern Johnson County and get to that location in 10 or 15 minutes, and you never even have to set your foot in the city. So the city's going to have to work harder. It's not just going to happen magically. Okay, as it's so rare, we get a benefit from your wisdom on this program, Kevin. We <laughs> it's to very rare to get quick, any wisdom from uh, a Kevin quick Collins round or, robin on some other know. development <laughs> projects round in the robin. metro. <laughs> Let's start quickly in Johnson okay. County, where the recent announcement that Macy's is leaving the Metcalf South Shopping Center, is leaving some questioning the future of that mall. Are we any wiser since that announcement at the beginning of the year? I don't think we're any wiser, but I do think that that is a demographic area around there. There's a lot of people that make good money. It's not going to be an enclosed shopping center. It is going to probably be demolished and replaced with either some so-called big box retailers or a combination of apartments and retail. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's like the Blue Ridge Mall. It's like the Indian Hill. It, these, this is just a dinosaur of a retail approach that is, in most cases, having its last gas. Barbara? I was just say I live kind of near Ward Parkway, and I'm kind of impressed with the way they brought that, that mall back yes. to life. Yeah, absolutely. Well, still in Johnson County, what about the Mission Mall, which was demolished in 2005, was supposed to be a world-class aquarium at one point, then a major retail and office development called the Mission Gateway Project. We heard recently in one of your articles before Christmas that the developer may be going back to the city to ask for more money to make this project a reality. Will this project ever be built? Well, it's, it, believe me, I live close to this location. I've seen the field grow weeds, and now it's been cleared, ready for development. Uh, you know, we haven't heard yet whether the developer is going to come back to Mission. He hinted that that might be a possibility. I think, you know, from what I know, he does have a firm contract with Walmart to do that corner of it. He explained that there might be some new opportunities. I understand the frustration in Mission. He has a lot of money in this deal, though. People tend to forget that these guys bought the old shopping center, tore it down on their own dime. They've been sitting on that land. They've been 
they've got a lot of skin in this game, to use that cliche, and they've got every reason in the world to get something built there. Maybe, maybe Cerner needs some space. You know, they could come <laughs> running in and buy some mission space as well. I'd love to see him come downtown, to be honest with you, but that's a whole different subject. Okay, on another issue, how many soccer fields do we need in the metro? Another huge soccer complex is in the planning stages. This time in Lee Summit, developers want to create a $230 million sports complex and entertainment village on the northeast corner of I-470 and View High Drive, City leaders want it to become a marquee gateway for the western edge of Lee Summit. 14 fields in all, which developers want to be among the best in the nation, surrounded by shops and restaurants, akin to what you'd find at Zona Rosa. But how many soccer fields do we actually need? And I should point out also, Barbara, you know, Swope mm -hmm. Park, the city of Kansas City, Missouri, just did a $13.5 million expansion, added soccer fields there as well. We've got the Overland mm -hmm. Park soccer complex yeah. as well. So we have a lot of fields. Could be the defining question of our time. How many <laughs> soccer fields do we need? Absolutely. So um, what is behind yeah. this development, uh, well, Kevin? Yeah, well, and I also want to throw in that, uh, you know, part of the whole uh, Sporting Kansas City deal also included a promise from Cerner to develop another dozen field tournament style uh, soccer complex there, which we're still waiting to see okay. when and that, where that's going to happen. I mean, there is a legitimate marketplace that had been underserved in our community. I mean, soccer is amazing. These tournaments, these families come for the weekend, they stay in hotels, they go to restaurants. Soccer is a huge sport. Look at how Sporting Kansas City has quickly risen to be one of the most popular things to do around here. I think there's probably at least room for a major development on the Jackson County side of the metro. Uh, whether this is going to be the one that gets the golden, uh, you know, uh, whatever the thing you grab when you're on the merry-go-round, I don't know. Uh, the brass ring. Okay. The brass ring. Thanks. Okay. Um, but it'll also be, I mean, Cerner is on the, is on the hook for a major tournament-style soccer complex in Wyandotte County, too. You know, I think there's probably room for one more large one, but, boy, if anybody goes out to, uh, to 135th and... Uh, and uh, Antioch and yes. sees that facility, that Overland Park, it is a machine. There are more people yes. per square inch around there than is like an ant. And parents do talk about how their kids have to play at like 8, 9 o'clock at night, sometimes right. later, just to even find a space to be on and, those fields. So that tournaments. says something about the demand. They travel for yeah. hundreds of miles for right. their kids to play in these okay. tournaments. Okay. Uh, thousands of Kansas Cityans join area tributes to slain civil rights leader Dr. Martin Luther King this week. This will be the day when all of God's children yes. will be able to sing with new meaning, my country tears of thee. Yes. Land of liberty According to the faith. Call newspaper, this is the only city in the United States that celebrates Dr. King and his vast accomplishments for an entire week. Is that right, Eric? That is correct. All righty. And also as a point of historic note, Kansas City celebration started even before there was an official holiday. Congressman Emanuel Cleaver, recovering from knee surgery, sent a message to his constituents advocating a living wage on the King holiday. We need to raise the minimum wage and tie it to inflation, he says. I hear my colleagues telling folks to pull themselves up by their bootstraps. But what if you've got no boots? But didn't the state of Missouri just this month raise the minimum wage? And isn't it tied to inflation in the show me state? Yes, but it's still behind. And at the mass celebration that they had, they had a group of people. They had a panel and workshop group before the actual mass celebration. And there were some people there talking about the minimum wage. And the minimum wage is always going to come behind. And and even though it sounds good to think that we're, we're making progress in that area, we're really not. It's, people are still suffering. People are still hungry. People are still uh, having issues financially. So the minimum wage battle is still going to be a conversation that's going to come up. I think they want $10 an hour or something for fast food restaurants. Don't think they're going to get it, but it's worth asking for anyway. Which really, at this point in Missouri, it's a seven dollars and fifty cents, just raised right. by fifteen mm -hmm. cents or so. Mm -hmm. right. uh, you know, Kansas City anti-crime activist Alonzo Washington tweeted out on the King's holiday: "The black community looks like a war zone in KC. King's dream is a nightmare if we tell the truth." The King holiday fell this week as City Hall reviewed new data on how Kansas City's teen curfew law is working. And City Councilman Jermaine Reed is alarmed at how 87 percent of the teens cited by police in the last reporting period were black. Is it unfair targeting or is it a police, as one police spokesman argued this week, just a function of who is choosing to violate the policy, Barbara Shelley? 
I don't know the answer to that, um, but I do think um, the point was well taken that people are confused about Kansas City's curfew laws. I mean, there's different uh, times for different areas of the city and entertainment zones, and I think there could be more of a public relations push to explain to people what the curfew is and, um, you know, how to, how to honor it. Um, you know, I think the city's done some pretty good work at providing options during the summer for of things for the kids to do and they probably need to move ahead with that even further but uh, Jermaine Reed though complaining this week that almost all of those citations relating to this curfew law all of them were on the plaza but almost exclusively were among uh, to black teens well we have a, a core value problem in black households and irregardless of of whether it was racial profiling, as he suggested, or what it was. The problem is that when you hear or think of black youth, there's a mob picture shown, and, and there's violence among black teens, but we don't show the positive uh, black kids that are doing positive things. So the perception is that they're all violent, out of control. We have unemployment problems, we have education problems, we have a lot of problems, and a lot of social problems. But I don't know if it rises to the level of a mob or, or war zone or something, as Alonzo al alluded to, but I know there's a problem and we have to address it. Kids aren't supposed to be there without their parents. Mm -hmm. That's a family value. It has nothing to do with racial profiling or anything else. That's a core family problem. And I would hear these stories of, you know, 12-year-olds down on the plaza at 11 o'clock at exactly. night or so. You know, that that's a problem. And I'm not sure what exactly Alonzo was referring to with the war-torn tweet. I have a hunch it wasn't curfew violations. I have a hunch it's the, cr the outrageous level of homicides in our city. I mean, Kansas City, we just had a story in the paper the other day uh, about New York and some of the places, large mm -hmm. cities, where they've seen their homicide rates drop substantially over the past 10 years. I couldn't believe it. I did a quick look at the statistics. Kansas City has five times the murder rate of New York City. Five times. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, if Martin Luther King is weeping in his grave, I think it's over the incredible violence that still plagues the inner city of our, of our country. And as we, as we mark this week, though, Martin Luther King's uh, holiday on Monday of this week, did you see any improvement, though, in the way that issue is being dealt with in Kansas City from last year, Eric? There was more talk about the easy accessibility to guns. There were more talk about bullets. I guess my thing with it is that we talk about and we make a comparison within cities. I think the homicide rate was down by two this past the year. Number homicides, the number of The number of homicides. But when you look at the population. But when you look at the population and we compare it to New York, Chicago, there's three times as many people there. There's three times as many issues there. Here, to me, the biggest issue is unemployment and the easy accessibility to guns, and nobody wants to talk about it. You can drive down Purcell. It's a pawn shop over there. Yeah. They have a sign that says, guns and ammo for sale. You can go to no other city in this metropolitan area and find a sign like that. So it indoctrinates in the, the mentality of the people okay. here, and then you've got the breakdown in the family. So you've got violence, yeah. and that's, that, that's and the I, core I, group. Okay. Clearly, there's a lot more to say about that. I did tease one another topic on this program. I want to get to that because it still involves this issue, changing the structure of city government in Kansas City, Missouri, by eliminating uh, all at-large city council seats and making everyone run in district was intended to increase minority participation in city government. But that idea, recommended by a charter review panel, was torpedoed this week by the city council, which refused to let voters decide the issue at the ballot box. Also this week, the city council voting against giving more power to the mayor to unilaterally fire the city manager. Manager. The council, though, did approve adding to the April ballot a measure to change elections in the city to warmer months. These issues had been studied for a better part of a year. So why didn't the council just let voters decide them at the ballot box, Dave Helling? Well, we should point out they did let them decide one thing, and that is to let them stay in office <laughs> even longer okay. than they would otherwise. But I think there was opposition to making the mayor more powerful, and the 
district only proposal was resisted by most of the sort of elites in town uh, and the council members themselves who didn't think it was a good idea. That's why they proceeded. And it that wasn't way. a clear picture of what it was going to look like. There were some behind the scenes statements that were made that some people on the council thought were offensive. You don't even know what the districts would look like. You just yeah. say 12. So, it's a very difficult right. thing. Right. You don't know how the money would be divided for PIAC. And, and I think historically, we were chatting earlier, I mean, Kansas City has had a pretty good representation of, uh, if there's anybody that should complain, it's probably a Latino community. Yes. But on the other hand, I, you know, I've been a city hall reporter in Omaha, Nebraska, where they were all at large, and it was awful. There was hardly, there was very little minority representation. I was in Buffalo, and it was completely district, and the council was so balkanized, there was very little cooperation that went on, and it was all about my own turf. I think from what I can see in Kansas City, it's, it, there is no, there's nothing here to fix. Barbara. Well, I think Dave's right. Um, Mayor James flew back from Washington yesterday to attend that council meeting and it ended up losing most of what he wanted. But the council looked out after itself. You know, they didn't want to do anything that would diminish their own power or interfere with their own political turf. Just make their terms <laughs> longer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. By a couple months on the other side. Right. So um, what, um, what difference would actually increasing, uh, changing the election date so you're in the warmer months for a primary and a general election, do you think that will really increase turnout that much? It, oh, yeah. Yeah, because I, yes, I do, because I think that February and March are very chilly months, particularly February in the primary. You will get more voters. Whether it changed the outcome or not is, is another question. The minority communities have to send better candidates. You can't say that we can't get elected when you have an African-American mayor that was elected at large and then say that you still can't get and people defeated a, a okay. Caucasian candidate. And that is our Week in Review. Our thanks to our news reviewers from the Kansas City Star, Dave Helling, and from the Cole, Eric Wesson. From the Star's editorial pages, Barbara Shelley, and Star Development writer, Kevin Collison. I'm simply Nick Haynes from all of us here <laughs> at KCPT. Thanks for spending part of your weekend with us.